Now, today I'm taking my scripture from the book of St. John, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, now this is Jesus speaking, and he will give you another helper, and the King James says another comforter, to be with you forever. In other words, I'm leaving, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be here not only now, but for succeeding generations. He'll be here for you and for the generations to come. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, and the reason they can't is the Bible said, they can't see him, neither do they know him, and I would like to add, if I may, without doing damage to the scriptures, or neither do they understand him. But Jesus said, you know him, for he dwells with you. And Jesus said, basically, when he comes and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, he will be in you. Okay, so here we go. You may be seated. I want to talk to you today about the precious baptism in the Holy Spirit. I want to address this as something that strongly, I believe, is on the mind of the Lord because he strongly impressed it upon me that you're gonna need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the days to come and you're also gonna need an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I don't want you to be afraid to ask the Lord for that encounter. It is the most wonderful thing. I remember when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was a teenager. I sought it for a long time and couldn't receive it. I tried my best. I had people pray over me at church. They had services where they prayed for people to receive the baptism. I'd go forward, I never could receive it. I got so discouraged, I felt like something was wrong with me. And so I finally gave up. And I just told the Lord one night, I was, when I got through praying, I said, well, Lord, I'm gonna make a deal with you. I don't know why you won't baptize me with the Holy Spirit, but uh, you know where I am. When you get ready to baptize me, look me up, I'm ready. <laughs> that's what I told him, I was a teenager, that's what I told him. But you know what happened? The Lord called me to preach before he baptized me in the Holy Spirit. So after the Lord called me to preach, then I had a dream and in the dream, I dreamed I was seeking the baptism and I went right through it in my dream and I woke up speaking in tongues in my bedroom. And I don't know if I got filled with the Holy Spirit in my sleep. I guess God had to put me to sleep and say, I'm gonna have to put this guy to sleep. To get, you know, we're gonna have to do some surgery on him, amen. But um, I woke up speaking in tongues and then later, when they laid hands on me at church, I went right through and it was just as easy and it made such a difference in my life. So for a few minutes today, I want to address again something that the Holy Spirit is strongly impressed on me, and that is the importance of the baptism in the coming days. Now you might be one of those people that just don't believe in the Holy Spirit. You've been uh, taught against it. Maybe you had a church or a pastor or a group of people, elders over you that told you that it was not for today. And um, you have been trained and brought up to, to believe that anybody that speaks in tongues or anybody that has a so-called encounter with the Holy Spirit is not of God. But I'm just gonna ask you to open up your ear and just listen carefully and see if the Lord doesn't speak to you about your need for the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're one of these that don't believe in the baptism, my heart hurts for you because I know who he is and I know the difference he made in my life and my family. And my heart hurts for people that's been trained against it because I know you, you really have a deficit in your life. And my heart, my heart hurts because the Holy Spirit is being ignored and he's being kept out of where Jesus wanted him to be. He's been restricted, he's, he's on restriction in many churches, in many denominations, he's on restriction. They will not let him get to the people and they will not let him manifest in the people. And they try to keep church neat and tidy 
and they try to keep it home in gardens religion, looking good, smelling good, everybody's fine. I'm fine, you're fine. And they try to keep the Holy Spirit out. So I want to just say this right off the bat. The first thing I want to say today is born, being born of the Spirit and being baptized in the Spirit are two different things. Being born of the Holy Spirit, these are two separate things. Being born of the Spirit and then being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Born of the Spirit is salvation. Now salvation is something that God gives you to be. Salvation causes you to be a Christian. Holy Spirit baptism causes you to do. Let me say it again. Salvation causes you to be born again. It is the becoming born again. You're born of the Spirit and you're born of the Word. But the Holy Spirit baptism is the ability to do you are empowered to effectively do the works of the ministry. Now, let me say this real quickly. I want you to understand that there's something that's really important for you to hear. And this is important for you to think about, and I want you to give it some thought. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the evidence, it gives the evidence of speaking in tongues and unknown language, it's the same Holy Spirit that baptized them in the upper room 2,000 years ago. He's the whole, same Holy Spirit that baptizes believers today. It is one Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, but two functions. You're filled with the Holy Spirit at salvation, but you are empowered and baptized with the Holy Spirit to do the works of the ministry, two different functions. I wanna show you something in the Bible. When Jesus was here in the book of John, he talked about two different things in regard to what he offers. There was a woman of Samaria that said unto him, how is it that you being a Jew ask of us to drink? And I'm a woman of Samaria. And the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. How can you give me living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. It'll be a satisfying slaking of a soul thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, he uses that word twice, well of water springing up into everlasting life, that's salvation. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is going to come, which is called Christ, and when he's come, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you am the Messiah. So the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is Jesus talked about water that came from a well. Now, everybody listen carefully. You live off of well water. It springs up. It's the Spirit of God that springs up in a person. It's a satisfying portion that satisfies your soul. It's salvation. Your sins are gone. You've been born again. You've been made anew. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And he gives these waters from a well that's known as salvation. But then Jesus says in the same book of John, now in chapter seven, he introduces a river. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 
He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow. Wells don't flow. Wells gurgle up. Wells keep a family alive. Wells keep a family where they have water to drink and where they have water to bathe and water to live. You live off of well water. But Jesus said, he that believeth on me, the scripture said, out of his belly, the innermost part of your belly, that's where your spirit is. Out of your innermost part of the belly will flow rivers of living water. But he spake of the spirit. Look at this, the Bible plainly says it. He spake of the spirit, that means the Holy Spirit which they that believe on him should receive because the Bible says in verse 39, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. He wasn't crucified yet. He wasn't offered up by the hands of wicked men and he hadn't been resurrected yet and he hadn't sent the Holy Spirit yet. But he's telling them, I'm gonna send what's known as a river and it's gonna be known as the river of the Holy Spirit but he said, he spake this of the Spirit because they which believe on him should receive. The Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So in two places in John, Jesus talks about water. He talks about well water, which is salvation. It springs up, it's satisfying, it's refreshing, it's salvation. You belong to the Lord. He's brought you living water. But then he said, I have something besides well water, and it's wells, ha <laughs> it's rivers of living water that will flow. And listen to me, rivers have current. I said rivers have current. Did you know many cities in America are built years ago on rivers? Cincinnati, I mean, I could just keep naming the places all kinds of cities in America was built on rivers. Why? Because the current of that river, that flowing river, would turn turbines. That's where your power plants come from. That's where the electricity comes from. You'll notice that the nuclear power plants are near rivers. Why? Because the rivers have current. What does the current do? It generates power. What is the Lord telling us here? I have something besides salvation. I have rivers of living water. And he said, these rivers are gonna generate power in your life. You're gonna to have to have power. Salvation will get you into heaven. Salvation is all it takes to be born again and to meet the Lord and go to heaven. But he said, while you're here, you're gonna need power because there's a devil and because there's sickness and because there's attacks. You're gonna need power to overcome the works of the enemy. And I'm glad to tell you there is power in the Holy Spirit. It is a baptism of power and when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one of the first things you'll notice is there's a boldness that comes upon you. And I just wanna tell you in the days to come, yes, we gotta be saved, yes, of course we do, but we're gonna to have to have power in the days ahead because you know as well as I do that the attack of the devil has been ramped up it's been ramped up against leaders all over this world. It's been ramped up against preachers, evangelists, prophets, teachers. It's been ramped up against their families. And if we've ever needed power, we need power today. Yes, we do. And the power that I'm talking about is not something spooky. I'm sick of spooky church. I'm sick of spooky religion. I'm seeing people walking around like their heads and they need a chiropractor to straighten them out, you know. And they're all bent over and they're all contorted and they're trying to prove to you our spirits. Just save it. I don't wanna see it, I don't wanna hear it. If you've got power, everybody's gonna know it. You don't have to tell nobody. And especially the devil's gonna know that you got power. I believe myself that we are living in a time that we're, we're dealing with uh, attacks on consistent levels now, whereas years ago it used to be sort of sporadic, but now it's sort of consistent, wouldn't you say? 
And not only that, but it seems like that the powers that we're dealing with are a little stronger than they used to be. And it's a tragedy that the church is not keeping up with what the devil's bringing. That's why you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Power to bind the works of, the e of evil and power to overcome his schemes, to know about his schemes and the plans of Satan and powerful gifts of the Holy Spirit given to Christians to overcome Satan. And here's what the Lord said in Acts chapter one. He said in verses four and five and verse eight, being assembled together with them, Jesus was with them, he commanded them, look at that please, he commanded them that they would not depart from Jerusalem. In other words, when I go up into heaven and I'm transfigured and I go up into heaven, I sinned. He said, don't go home, stay here in Jerusalem. I've set up an appointment with you with the Holy Spirit. Don't leave. Wait for the promise of the Father, which you have already heard me talk to you about. And he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You will receive power. He told me, he said, now you're gonna receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about cessationism. Cessation. What is cessation? It is a belief that tongues it is a belief that says that tongues and spiritual gifts are not for today, that they ceased with the passing of the apostles. When they died, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit died with them, and there's a cessation of the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, they're no longer current. That is a belief that has permeated the Christian world around the world, especially in America. And they believe that when the last apostle died, that the gifts of the Spirit died and ended with them. So I want to tell you, and I hope to prove it today, that tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for us today. The gifts of the Holy Spirit did not pass away with the apostles because they would have been known as the gifts of the apostles, not the gifts of the Spirit. Can I say that again? If the gifts died with the apostles, it would have been known as the gifts of the apostles. But the Bible plainly calls them the gifts of the Spirit. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 12 and 7 in the King James Version. It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, not just the apostles. But the gifts of the Spirit is given to every man. Why? To profit to profit with all. He said it's given to every man, not just the apostles, but every person in the body of Christ. So the cessationist doctrine was introduced while the New Testament was being written. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. I wanna stay on this just for a minute. Just listen to me carefully. This cessationist doctrine was being introduced and perpetuated while the New Testament writers, the apostles were still on the earth writing their books and writing their epistles. It was a bold move of the Sadducees and the Pharisees to put out the fires of Pentecost and to smother the embers and to put out any power and any baptism of power to put it out, and they began to come up with this doctrine. Even while the apostles were still living, they still was writing this doctrine that it ceased, and it was gonna cease for the days of the apostles, it wouldn't last. So here's what Paul said in his writings. I'm just gonna give you a few places of what the apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said that tongues are an institution given to the church. It's an institution. It was instituted by God through the Apostle Paul to write about it and to educate us. And so he wants us to welcome tongues. He wants us to welcome the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Paul said 
Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Now, the reason why Paul wrote that do not forbid to speak with tongues is because while Paul was still here, the powers that be went to work against Paul immediately. They couldn't kill him. They, they, they stoned him. They left him for dead a number of times. They couldn't kill him at that time. So now they attacked his doctrine. And so Paul said, do not forbid to speak with tongues because already the religious crowd was beginning to be affected by the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Sadducees. It was beginning to have inroads even into the early church. So Paul was writing to the church Corinth and he said, don't forbid, brethren, those of you that's gonna lead the church, don't forbid the people from speaking in tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, New King James Version, he said, I wish you all spoke with tongues. This is the Apostle Paul that wrote most of the New Testament. He said, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. And then Paul said this in 1 Corinthians, New King James Version. He said, I speak with tongues more than you all. Now there's a lot of people that would try to lead you to believe that they were all speaking in tongues and languages that everybody understood. He was talking about unknown tongues. And he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So he said, I speak with tongues more than you all. He wrote it. He wrote about the Holy Spirit. He's the one that got the revelation of it. God gave it to him. So these words came from a pen of a man that believed, promoted, and defended speaking in tongues. That's in your Bible. You can't get around it. It's right there. Now I want to talk about the Sadducees for a minute. I want to just show you what Jesus was up against. I want to show you what we're up against right now, especially if you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. I want to show you what you're up against. Let's look at the Sadducees. And in Matthew 16 and verses 6 and 8, verses 11 and 12, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's mentioned both of them. He said, Take care and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They are reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we didn't take, we forgot to bring bread with us. But Jesus, being aware of that, said to them, Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you didn't bring any bread? How is it that you don't understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But I am talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine. Look at that. Of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What Jesus was saying here is, Guys, I've got to leave. I'm going to be offered up. I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to go. The Holy Spirit's going to come. But already, the Sadducees have got a plan, and the Pharisees have got a plan, and they're going to try to make inroads, and this is leaven, and it doesn't take much leaven to leaven the whole lump. And it's the same way today. They're still trying to cancel out what God left for us to enjoy, to help us in the days ahead. I'm not gonna let it happen. There were two major religious groups in Jesus' day that was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't hardly believe in anything. They didn't, they didn't subscribe to anything supernatural, nothing. Today, we have that same lump of leaven that has crept in, it's called the leaven of the Sadducees. And when it was introduced, that leaven was introduced, it spread quickly. It's the leaven of no glossolalia and no charismata. In other words, no manifestation of the Holy Spirit, no glossolalia speaking in tongues, no charismata 
which is spiritual gifts. That's the doctrine of the Sadducees. In Jesus' day, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Angels are the spirit. They had a dogma. They had a belief system, but it would not permit anything supernatural whatsoever. I want to say something real quick, and I want to be nice about it. I'm going to try. <laughs> but we're living in a nation now where the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Sadducees has crept into almost every mainline religious denomination. And they believe in heaven and they believe in hell and they believe in the cross and those kinds of things. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit and when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and when it comes to power, when it comes to casting out devils and healing the sick, that leaven of the Sadducees has crept in and we have a certain place that we will go in America, in our mainline churches, but it will not cross the line when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying this, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it another chance. Let's repent, ask God to forgive us, and let's ask him for a fresh baptism in the Holy Ghost. It's gonna take it. It's going to require it. So, what accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the power to heal. Because the Bible said that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit salvation is a well, but when it comes to being able to do the works of the ministry, that includes the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, and some of those gifts are power gifts. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That requires power. You shall cast out devils in my name. That requires power. So I'm here to tell you in many churches that love the Lord and their name is on the record in heaven, they're going to heaven, but the devil's having a heyday with them because they don't believe in the power to deal with what the devil's dishing out. They don't believe in it. And if I preached this in many churches in America this morning, there wouldn't be anybody left in here after five minutes. They would have hit the door thinking that I'm crazy. No, I'm not crazy, I'm telling you, God left us in the hands of the precious Holy Spirit and that's where we need to stay and we need everything the Holy Spirit has. The days are coming. He's going to be very, very, very important in your life. Let me talk to you real quickly about two things that the Holy Spirit will help you with. When you come to the Lord, the Bible says that we all were shapen in iniquity and in sin that our mothers conceive us. So when we're born, we're born sinners. So when we come to the Lord and we become born again, we ask the Lord to come into our lives. He comes in and we're born again. Our spirit is made alive. The light of the Lord comes on. But because we've been shaped in sin, shaped in iniquity and in sin that our mothers conceive us, when the Lord comes in, he forgives us of our sins. In other words, I want to talk about the penalty of sin. I think many times a lot of people are really interested in getting the penalty of sin dealt with. They don't want to go to hell. And so, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of the adultery, Lord. Forgive me of the lying, Lord. Forgive me of the theft. Forgive me of this. Forgive me of that. And so they ask the Lord to forgive them and they're born again and they're forgiven and they're washed and they're made white by the blood of Jesus. But many times that carnal man has still got those iniquity drives inside and it's a structure. It's a structure that we were born with. There's two words that I wanna to talk to you about before I move on today. One of them is edification, and another one is purging. The baptism of the Holy Spirit actually begins with the process of edifying our edification inside the believer to get us ready to be purged of some things. So the word edify means this. It means to instruct in such a way as to improve, enlighten, uplift morally, spiritually, or intellectually. 
So the root word for edification comes from a Latin word which means to build or to construct. So here's what this scripture says. Look at this. This is very good. I want you to sort of make the connection with me if you can. This is a building. This is an edifice. Edification, you know what it means to edify one another. It means to build up one another. And so here's what the Bible says in Corinthians 14 and 4. It says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now listen, this is not a language. This is not a dialect. It is an unknown tongue. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesies edifies the church. It's not saying anything frowning on him edifying himself because that's what believers do. Many times we have our prayer language and we pray and we edify ourselves. That means we're constructing, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to give us a different construction than what we were born with. You follow me? In other words, he's rebuilding some things in us. He's forgiven us. He's washed us clean. He's taken it out of the way. But now he's going to build moral character in us. And the, the word of God is going to take up a residence in us. So when you're praying in an unknown tongue, you don't really realize it when you're praying in an unknown tongue. But there's a construction that the Holy Spirit's doing on the inside of you where a new edifice is coming up. Now, edification is not some kind of like an electrical charge. Pow! Oh, glory to God. You know, that's not it. Edification is a process where God is deliberately choosing not to leave you in a carnal state. But he sent his Holy Spirit to redo you on the inside. It's called the inner man. And he sent the Holy Spirit to fortify that inner man and to make inside of you a structure that God can build you for future service and to be, get you ready for whatever's coming upon the earth. You're gonna have a building on the inside of you that's gonna be a structure, that you're gonna be strong, you're gonna be stable, and you're gonna be an influencer. In Jude, look at chapter 20, or, or, or Jude, this one chapter, but verse 20, it says, but you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. There it is again. Now, we're talking about different places in the Scriptures. Jude's writing his book. And Jude's even talking about praying in the Holy Ghost. Friend, I just am so amazed sometimes at how people have been so trained against the Holy Spirit. But it's right there in your Bible Sometimes you just need a preacher to go in there and pick out different places to show you that it's all through your Bible about these unknown tongues and speaking to yourselves in the Spirit. And here's what it says. Building up yourselves. Building, there's a word, building. Look, look at me, everybody. You know one of the main jobs of the devil is to tear you down. One of the main jobs of the devil is to tear you down by humiliating you and by intimidating you. You're no good. Oh, you think you're a preacher? Oh, you think you're something, don't you? Why, there's nothing to you. There never has been nothing to you, and he'll tear you down. But when you get in the Spirit and you begin to pray in the Spirit, there's something about it. You rise up, and you're strong, and you're fortified, and you're undergirded. It's this of construction that starts taking place on the inside of you where God is now building you up and by speaking in tongues, you're building your inner man up and you're becoming strong. One of the things that I see in these last days is so many Christians are collapsing, so many Christians are throwing in the towel and it's mainly because we have ousted the Holy Spirit from our lives. Now, let me talk to you about purging. What does purging mean? Purging means to clear of guilt, to be free of ceremonial or moral defilement, to cause evacuation of the impure so the pure can stay. Look at that. To cause the evacuation of the impure, in other words, get it out, so the pure can remain. To be free of an unwanted substance. 
to eliminate and to be rid of anything undesirable. So in other words, if there's gonna be an edifying, an edifice, a building, God's building something in you, he's building character in you now. You've been saved and you love the Lord and you're now reading the word and your mind's being transformed, but you still got some edifices in there that came from the old life, the carnal man. And you know, if you notice a lot of times when they get ready to build, before they ever build, they'll bring excavators in and the excavators will take down the old. And the guys that operate those excavators are, I love to watch them operate those things and they just, they take everything down, they put it in dump trucks, they haul it off. One of the first things that happens whenever you go to build is that one of the first things is they bring in a dumpster and they bring in big dump trucks because the persons on the excavators is gonna raise and take down the old because they're getting ready for the new to come up. That's what the Holy Spirit's talking about here about purging. There's gonna come a time that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is gonna say, okay, now you're born again, but it's time for me to start purging some things out of your life. It's time for me to start getting rid of some things in your life that's had you bound. It's time for me to take some things down that's hindering you from being what God wants you to be. I've gotta take it down. Look what the Lord said. I think this is so good in John. This is Jesus speaking. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. Used to, when I'd go out deer hunting years ago, I'd climb trees and hunt out of a deer stand. I had that portable deer stand, I'd pull my legs. I'd climb way up in the tree and I'd pull my deer stand behind me. But sometime I'd run into a dead branch, a dead limb, and it would hinder from me from going on up. So I made a note of it, that the next time before I tried to take my deer stand up high, I had to purge that limb, that dead limb off. Because that dead limb kept me from going where I needed to go. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do in your life, is as he's building a new edifice on the inside of you, getting you ready for who you are, where you're going, what you're gonna do. He's getting you ready to be a moral man. He's getting you ready to be a godly husband. He's getting you ready to be a powerful preacher. He's getting you ready to be a powerful leader. And he's gonna start this edification, this edifice. He's building an edifice on the inside of you. And if you see what God's starting, you're gonna to have to understand there's gonna be some things that he's gonna to have to purge. Purging means that there's some things that once was in your life, but the Lord doesn't want them in your life anymore. And you know, there was things that you once did and you were perfectly comfortable doing it as a sinner, but now that you're a Christian, the shell of that is left. And the Lord said, I want that shell gone, I want everything gone, because what I'm doing in you, if that can't remain, I'm doing something new in your life. And what I'm trying to say is, if God's doing something new in your life, you have to let the Lord purge you. Holy Spirit will purge you and he'll take away those things. When a butterfly comes out of that cocoon, the cocoon is no more good, purge it. When God takes you out of what you used to be, the Holy Spirit's gonna come in and he's gonna say, I'm gonna purge that and I'm gonna take that out of the way. Let me hurry. You remember, you remember Lazarus? Jesus came to the tomb where he was buried and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible said he came forth. <clears throat> but when he came forth, he had on grave clothes. And he sort of waddled up to the mouth of the cave. And what the Lord said to the disciples was, let me paraphrase, there's my man, purge him. Cut the grave clothes off of him. You see, when God's doing a powerful work in your life, and he's building something in you, he's bringing resurrection life in you, you gotta realize those grave clothes have to do with death. Those grave clothes have to do with something that happened to you. It was a death situation. 
It was not a life situation. It's attached to Lazarus. And the Lord said, I want you to get off of Lazarus. Everything that represents death, everything that's going to hinder him, he can't move like he needs to move. He can't go where he needs to go. Cut the grave claws off of him. And that's what God's going to try to do to many of you by giving you the Holy Spirit. You're going to edify yourself. There's going to come a new building on the inside of you. And God's going to purge you and take things out. You won't crave the things you used to crave. You won't want to do the things you used to do. You won't want to tell lies. And you used to be a prolific liar. But now you don't want to tell lies. Why? Because you've edified yourself by speaking in other tongues and God's starting a different construction in you. And you're turned off to lies now. Well, I could just keep going. Let me talk to you about more benefits of praying in tongues. I'm gonna give you two more before I close. What's the more benefits of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues? What are the benefits? One of them is found in the book of Acts chapter 10, verses 45 and 46. It says, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also were poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at this. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Everybody look, look this way. Here's what you're going to have to understand. And this is not going to get any better. This is why I'm telling you, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit worse than I can even describe to you. But the Bible says, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, what did the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? John 16, Jesus said this. He said, now when the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself but whatsoever he hears, that will he speak, and he will show you things to come, and he will glorify me. Jesus said the Holy Spirit, his main function is to glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. So the Bible says, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Let me tell you what, we live in a death-dealing environment. There's death all around us. It's on social media, it's on television, it's in politics, it's even in religion. Everywhere you look, there's a spirit of death. And what that spirit of death does to Christians is it tries to dumb down how great God is in your life. It tries to dumb down the almightiness of God and the magnificence of God. It dumbs it down. But when you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Bible said they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit will remind you how great God is. You may have forgot how great he is. You may have not remembered what God has done. You may not have remembered what the Bible said about him, but the Holy Spirit will magnify God and cause you to magnify God. And when you magnify God, all your problems begin to diminish. What's happening right now is, What's happening right now is things are being magnified above God. Everywhere you look, trouble in the family, trouble in your finances, trouble on the job, trouble in the church. Everywhere you look and you're becoming jaded about how great God is. But when you speak in tongues, the Bible said that the Holy Spirit will magnify the Lord. That's what David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. The last point I want to bring out about praying in tongues is it synchronizes us with the timing of God. Praying in tongues will synchronize you with the timing of God. Time comes from the word chronos, which means seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. That's chronos. It's a chronological outlay of time. Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, -I -I Kairos, is an appointed and an opportune time, a specific moment. It's a supreme moment 
in the purposes of God. It's a time when God acts. One of the things about praying in the Spirit is it will take you past the chronos time and it will lead you into opportunities of kairos, specifically ordered times where it couldn't happen any other time but that time. And by praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads you to that moment, that Kairos moment, where it's going to be a divine opportunity. So supernatural timing is required for your success. Look at a powerful revelation. This is found in the book of Acts. Now when they had gone throughout Figria, uh, Figria, Figria and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. They were come to Mysia, and they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, Macedonia assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Now in the message it reads like this. They went to Figria and then on through the region of Galatia. Their plan was to turn west into Asia province, but the Holy Spirit blocked that route. So they went to Mysia tried to go north to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them go there either. Proceeding on through Mysia, they went down to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a dream. And a man, a Macedonian man, stood on the far shore and called across the sea, come over to Macedonia and help us. And the dream gave Paul his mouth and went to work at once getting things ready to cross over into Macedonia and all the pieces came together. So we knew now for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans, but he forbade us to go to Asia. They were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to proceed where they were going and they headed that way. And in time they were going into a chronological time where they were going to do missionary journeys into Asia. But that was cut short by a Kairos moment where the Holy Spirit, as they were praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit said, no, I prohibit you from going into Asia. Turn and go this way. He suffered them not, the Bible said. So they had a plan, but that plan had to be adjusted by the Holy Spirit. They had to synchronize their plans with the Holy Spirit's Kairos. And all the pieces came together. And you've got to realize, just as I have to realize, that we're in God's time, uh, a chronological time, but we might not be in his timing. And one of the main jobs of the Holy Spirit in you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in you, is to help you be prepared for those kairos moments that you would miss otherwise. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. But the Spirit prohibited them from going into Asia. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues aligns us with God's purposes and God's timing. Well, I'll just tell you a couple of stories and I'm gonna close. <clears throat> I remember when I was a boy, my pastor was a very godly man. And uh, he was a perfect, perfect mentor perfect example. I never met anybody like him before or since. I wish I had his walk with God that he had. <clears throat> I was thrilled and privileged beyond words to be under him. <clears throat> but I remember mother and I went to church this Sunday morning and we had a good turnout that day. There's a lot of people in church and pastor was up preaching and there was a woman there. She came with her two little girls and she had been diagnosed with a fatal disease and it was killing her. 
And she come, rode the Greyhound bus to Columbus, Georgia to take her little girls by her mother and dad's house and she was gonna leave them there and she was gonna go off and die. <clears throat> so pastor was preaching that morning and while he was preaching, that woman was sitting there knowing she didn't know him, she didn't know the pastor, never been to that church, didn't know anything about that church. But the Holy Spirit led her there. And she was coming to drop off those little girls. So she was sitting there and pastor was preaching and he was just preaching something completely different. And she got to thinking about, well, you know, I really need to get home and get dinner for these kids. I've got to catch the bus and I've got to go and I've got to leave these kids with mama. So she was just getting ready to leave, just getting her stuff together to stand up and leave. And it was a Kairos moment. And God spoke pastor and he said, wait just a minute, ladies and gentlemen. He said, you know, he said, I, I'm receiving something from the Lord. And he said, there's a woman here. And he said, you have come here and have brought your little girls with you to leave with your parents. And he said, you're gonna leave them because you have plans to go off in a sanatorium and die because you have an incurable disease and you wanna make sure your children are taken care of. But he said, the Lord said, oh no, you're not gonna die. He said, today healing is in the house. Go ahead. No, you're not gonna die. And so he said, come on up here, baby. Wherever you are, he didn't know where she's sitting. And she stood up and she stood up and started trembling, shaking like that. Because he, he read her mail. She's come to bring her kids and die. So she's shaking, she can hardly walk. She's shaking violently. Just, you know, just, she was expectant and nervous at the same time. And so he, right there in the aisle, he just reached out tenderly and touched her and he said, in the powerful name of Jesus, I bind the spirit of death off of you and I curse that thing. I command it to depart from you and leave you and for health to break out in your body from this moment forth. And she started like that, like she was gonna throw up. And some of the women in the church got her and took her hurriedly to the bathroom. And they wasn't back there 10 minutes. And you heard, you never heard the lack of shouting and dancing and glorifying God in all your life. And we thought they'd never come out. We're out there waiting for the report. <laughs> and in just a few minutes, they came out and they had a handkerchief. And when they came out, there was a tumor she spit up and it had roots all over it. And when they came out, you could see the roots and the tentacles and the roots attached to that tumor. And she threw it up in the bathroom and that woman lived and did not die. Come on, give God praise. I said, give God praise. What a mighty God we serve. I said, what a mighty God we serve. What happened? What happened? She was getting ready to leave. And the Holy Spirit knew that he brought her there. And Holy Spirit knew that pastor was in his sermon and was gonna finish his sermon. And so the Lord had to bring a Kairos moment about and told the pastor, there's someone here. He caught her just before she got up and left. It was an intersection of a divine supernatural power that, whoo. I wish somebody would give God praise here today. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. One more story. When I was in Bible school, I remember we had this man come and spoke to our chapel service. And he told this story in chapel that morning. And when he told that story, revival broke out and we didn't have class for three days after that. He said, when I was a young man, I can't remember if he was in the ministry yet, but he was a violinist and he was an accomplished violinist and he was on a train. And this train was just chugging along and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want you to get off up here at the next stop. 
And he thought, well, Lord, I'm on the way to a concert and I've got to be there, but okay. So at the next stop, he got off. He had his luggage in one hand, his violin in the other hand. And the train pulled off and he said, okay, Lord, now what? And the Lord says, start walking and I'll tell you what to do. And he just started walking with his violin and his luggage. And it was a small town in the country in Illinois. And he just started walking. And he said, well, Lord, what do I do? And the Lord said, I'll tell you. And he got up to a little street up there and the Lord said, turn here. And then turn back as soon as you get on that street, turn this way and just keep walking. And he said, the rest will take care of itself. Well, when he started walking that way, there was a woman that had a daughter that was tremendously afflicted. She was gnarled up in the bed like a knot. No control of saliva, no control of her bowels. She was a young girl, a teenager, early 20s maybe, but she was gnarled up in the bed, pulled and in constant pain. And the mother had gone as far as she could go and there was nothing else. And she said, God, you're going to have to help me. I believe in you. I trust you. I tell people what you can do. Please help me. And she said, the Lord spoke to her and said, tomorrow morning, be out in front of your house at 1030 and stand there. And he said, there'll be a man coming towards you with a suitcase and a violin. And he said, when he comes, you tell him to come in your house. So he's walking down the street and this woman jumps up and down. She's crying and she's screaming, oh my God, I can't believe it. Oh my God, oh my God. And she went out there, he didn't know anything. She's wrapping her arms around him and he's thinking, oh, this is gonna be good. And he said, she brought him in the house, brought him upstairs, and there's that girl laying there like a big knot in the middle of the bed, all pulled, just totally deformed. He said, I got there and I didn't know what in the world, what, Lord, what have you brought me here for? I don't know what to do. And the Lord spoke to him and said, just start playing Amazing Grace, how sweet this is. And he said, students, I pulled my violin out, put it up to my chin, and the first refrain that I hit on those strings, he said, Phew, a power came on that girl from the time I hit the strings on that violin. And he said, amazing grace, how sweet. He wasn't singing, he was just playing it. And he said, students, that bed started jerking. The covers was flying up. The covers was flying around. I heard bones popping. I heard bones cracking. I looked at that girl. I was afraid to look. It sounded like she was being killed. And he said she was being bumped and those bones were jerking and snapping and popping. And he said, by the time I got through playing and when we've been there 10,000 years, he said that girl was totally healed, totally healed by the power of God. Listen to this. <laughs> oh, come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Listen to this, let me finish. That girl had not talked in years. She had been gnarled up and was getting more gnarled up by the day. And when it was over, he said she was full of sweat, her hair was stuck to her head, and her clothes were soaking wet with sweat. And she sat up in the bed and said, Mama, I'm hungry. Now what happened? Here's this man driving along on a train and the Holy Spirit said, this is not gonna be a Kronos moment. This is gonna to have to be a Kairos moment. This has nothing to do with time. This has everything to do with timing. And he told the woman, be standing outside about 10.30 tomorrow. 
He told her that the day before. And sure enough, what time did he get there? 10.30. And he went upstairs and played that violin, Amazing Grace. And God did a great miracle. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had an intersection of time where the natural was going to meet the supernatural. <laughs> 